I'm Armando Carbonell. I chair the Department of Planning and Urban Forum here. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to introduce a good friend of the Lincoln Institute, a fellow here, as well as a low fellow at Harvard, uh, Gil Kelly. Uh, for those of you who are very close friends of Gil Kelly, <laughs> I can see looking around, but for those who don't uh, know him, uh, up until this year, Gil was the planning director of Portland, Oregon, uh, a job he held for uh, almost 10 years. Uh, for 10 years before that, he was the planning director of Berkeley, California. So he's a seasoned planning director, and in his Portland job, he participated in a program that we do at the Lincoln Institute with the Harvard Graduate School of Design and the American Planning Association for big city planning directors. And I'd say he had a, an instrumental role in uh, bringing to that group this very topic of uh, planning for climate change and the role of cities in both uh, mitigating greenhouse gas emissions and uh, adapting to unavoidable climate change that uh, affects cities. So uh, Gil is going to talk about work he's been doing this year while in Cambridge that relates uh, the form of cities to climate change and in particular talk about what we can learn from the city of Portland, Oregon and how that might uh, be uh, extended to look uh, at other cities in the United States and around the world. So Gil, if you're ready, sure. we'll welcome you up here. Thank you very much, Armando. <clears throat> some of this that I'll say may be familiar to some of you. Um, uh, this is an audience that uh, appears from the looks of it and from the people I know here to be fairly well schooled in some of the background on climate change issues. Um, so I'll try to dispense with some of the background rather quickly and get to the meat of the matter, but I, I do want to set it up uh, in a way. So uh, I, I think the first part of what I'd like to say is to thank Armando, uh, Greg, and the uh, Lincoln Institute for um, really expressing an, a, a deep interest in this topic over the last several years. Um, it wasn't really a mainstream popular topic uh, just a few years ago, and Lincoln has really dedicated itself among among other investigations, to really looking at this phenomenon of the um, application of ideas about uh, city shaping or urban form uh, to uh, mitigating uh, climate change. Uh, and that's really, my focus is about mitigating climate change here, not so much about adapting to climate change, which is the other half of the equation, of course, and also concerns uh, the shape and form uh, of cities. Um, but I'm going to focus on the mitigation piece. Um, and I think that's because uh, it's really putting the uh, horse before the cart to think about mitigating the levels first. Um, everything we do to knock down the potential levels of increases uh, means we have a lot less extreme and expensive work to do on the adaptation side. There will still be lots of that. But um, everything I read in here is that... Uh, it really becomes exponentially more difficult if we uh, wait any longer uh, and don't act aggressively uh, to really mitigate the possible worst effects of uh, climate change and the uh, increases uh, in greenhouse gas emissions that bring those. Uh, I, the other point I want to make at the beginning here is that uh, while many institutions have been kind of racing to embrace technological advances to um, reduce uh, climate change, um, electric cars, various kinds of energy technologies and so forth. Um, even nuclear power and so-called clean coal are coming up as uh, components of that. And I think that's, those are fine to in investigate, but I'm particularly heartened by Lincoln's uh, focus on the possibility that there may be some good old-fashioned ways in which we shape our cities that may actually pay as much or potentially even greater benefits than some of those probably both technology uh, and uh, city planning, city development will be absolutely necessary to meet the climate change challenge. I just want to give you one example of that to sort of keep in your mind, and that is um, let's just take one standard work trip um, by car. And most Americans travel some distance now from the outskirts of the city to an employment center, either elsewhere in the suburbs or in the middle of the city. And that's generally done by a gasoline-powered engine, often driving um, solely, sometimes car sharing. Um, pr 
probably the best we can do in 25 or 30 years is to get the average efficiency of that vehicle to knock off maybe 35 percent when you only take a gross average of the carbon emissions. That's because the, the U.S. fleet only turns over about once every 17 years and there's only so much we can do with technology that we now see. They could accelerate, but I, get, I guess I want you to compare in your mind the notion uh, that we like to use in Portland of the trip not taken. That is to say, if you can walk or take transit to work, that's 100% efficiency, not 35% uh, efficiency. And so that's the kind of idea, I think, that we're talking about when we talk about the power of urban form uh, in this arena. How much of the climate change reduction that is needed by 2050, which is sort of the magic year, um, after which we become, all become toast, and many are saying if we don't start aggressively by 2015 on that road to 2050, uh, we may not be able to reach the 2050 targets. Um, uh, how much could come from manipulating the urban form in, in beneficial ways is really a subject of debate. There's a major study out now, the Transportation Research uh, Board, which basically says somewhere between 3 and 10 percent along those lines. Not, uh, not the overwhelming number I was hoping for. I think there are reasons to question that number and see if that could be lifted. But I think even taking a 10 percent figure um, uh, is not overly optimistic and one that is still going to be necessary for contribution. And I'll talk in a little bit about why I think that range could be questioned and could be a bit low. But mostly I'm going to focus on the question of, so how would we get there, whether it's 10 percent or 20 percent of the equation, uh, how would we get there and how might some of the lessons from from Portland um, be applicable in this discussion and potentially transferable to other cities. Um, I want to say two things before getting into the heart of the analysis and that is that um, Portland has had a success story and we'll talk about that in a moment, but it is limited. Um, it is not currently on a trajectory to meet those 2050 numbers. Um, it, uh, there's a lot of policy language in place that is a hopeful path to get us there. Uh, but when you see the results here in a minute, you'll see there's a lot more that has to be done, both in terms of the strategies we've already employed, beefing those up, intensifying those, and availing ourselves of lots of other um, means by which to get there. Um, so so it's, a, it's a good story, but it's not the whole story. It's not sufficient to just say, just be like Portland, everything will be fine. Um, uh, and I think it may provide those some clues uh, to how we might succeed uh, uh, in a few other areas. The other thing I'd like to mention is that um, this uh, talk today is part of a work in progress, so I don't have definitive answers for you. And I'll be continuing this work uh, with Armando and others over the next couple months to kind of uh, fill in some of the gaps here and uh, do a phase two, which I'll talk about as we get a little bit further into the presentation. But along those lines, your comments and questions today will be extremely helpful to me in, in completing this investigation. So um, have at it when we get to that point. I think we'll probably hold questions <coughs> until the end. I think it would probably be most efficient. Um, so I wanted to just uh, start with some key assumptions that I made uh, for my investigation. Again, some of these are very general, but I think they are extremely important. And when you get outside of rooms like this and out into the general public discussion, it's rather amazing how shaky <laughs> the knowledge is about the climate change phenomenon. So uh, first of all, um, stating the obvious that um, a key underpinning here for me is that the climate change phenomenon is real. Um, <coughs> that it, this is of a geologic proportions. This isn't simply a cycle in modern history. That since industrialization, the curve has been off the charts. Um, uh, which says uh, a couple of things. One is that uh, those levels pose significant risk, not only to our natural environment, but to society itself.